All right, guys, here it is. It is your last chapter test review for calculus. We're going to go ahead today and review um, for the chapter 9 test. What you need to know, you do need to know the formulas for integration by substitution and integration by parts. Now, normally, if this would have been um, an in-the-classroom test, you would have had to have these memorized. This is an at-home test, okay? So feel free. You can use your notes. You can use your books. So you do not have to have these memorized, okay? Um, be able to identify all of the pieces for each method, just like we have been for all of Chapter 9. I do give you points. What is f of x? What is g of x? Tell me what those derivatives and antiderivatives are. So the final answer is really only worth one point, whereas the whole problem can be six, seven, even eight points at times. So make sure that you are identifying all of the pieces. Use the fundamental theorem of calculus. When you have a definite integral, like we see in number five and number six, once you find the antiderivative, then you go ahead Use the fundamental theorem of calculus to evaluate. And then calculate present value. There's one of those on the back. So let's get going. Number one. Okay, if I look at this, if I'm checking for substitution, and I will tell you that substitution works, okay? If I'm doing substitution, my f of x would be the sine of x. g of x would be 2x minus 4. The derivative of this would be a 2. Well, technically, I have a 1 out here. I can turn a 1 into a 2 easily, okay? You can change the numbers out front. So I will use substitution. This is the antiderivative of f. Fill in g of x plus c. There's the formula, okay? So again, when you're doing substitution, it is a decomposition. The outside function is just the sine of x. But what was filled in instead of x was 2x minus 4. When you're doing substitution, you find the derivative of g of x, which is 2. That means that there's a 2 here. What I'm seeing is a 1. So there had to have been something outside that would have changed the 2 to a 1. That would be a 1 half because 2 times the 1 half would get you to the 1. Okay. Now your antiderivative. And again, because it is open book, open note for you, you did have this little um, cheat sheet that I sent not the last packet I gave you, but the previous one. If you kept this, go ahead and hang on to it because now I can look. I want the antiderivative of a sine. Antiderivative of a sine is a negative cosine of x and it's plus c. So now I'm going to go ahead and find my antiderivative. I have the one half out front because remember you have to make that derivative of g of x match whatever is there. So I have the one half out front. Now it's the antiderivative of f, so negative cosine, but instead of x, you fill in your g of x. So 2x minus 4 plus c. So final answer, I'm just going to simplify this by taking my one half times my negative sign. So negative one half times the cosine of 2x minus 4 plus c, and you are done with number one. That's it. Okay, number two, we do have to do integration by parts because if I try to do substitution, f of x would be x to the power of 9, g of x would be x plus 1. The derivative of x plus 1 would be a 1. I can't change a number into a letter by multiplying by a constant. So this one has to be integration by parts. The formula is f of x times the antiderivative of g of x minus the antiderivative of the derivative of f of x times the antiderivative of g of x dx, okay? So again, make sure that you list all of the different pieces. This is similar to what you would have done for the product rule moving forward. So f of x is the first term. Guys, they still have the bells on at school. That's what you just heard. <laughs> okay, so f of x is x. g of x is the second piece, x plus 1 to the power of 9. Now notice here you do the derivative of f of x because that's part of the property or part of our um, formula. The derivative of x is a 1. The antiderivative of g of x because we need the antiderivative for g. I take the current exponent and I add 1. This is a 9, so if I add 1 it becomes a 10. You divide by 10, so it's the same as 1 over 10 out front. You keep the parentheses the same. 9, when I added 1, it became a 10. Now you'd multiply it by 1 over whatever the derivative of the inside would be. 
Well, the derivative of the inside is 1. 1 over 1 is 1, so it's not going to change anything. So plus C. Okay, I'm going to use a separate sheet of paper because sometimes integration by parts, at least for me, it gets kind of lengthy. Okay, so if I take f of x times the antiderivative of g of x, I'm going to go 1 over 10x. I just multiplied that x by the 1 tenth that's out front. Times the group x plus 1 to the power of 10 minus the antiderivative of, now you're going to multiply these two. 1 times 1 over 10 is 1 over 10 x plus 1 to the power of 10, and this is now dx. It's dx because I still have to find an antiderivative. My 1 over 10, that is a constant I can bring it out front. So 1 tenth x, x plus 1 to the power of 10, minus 1 tenth out front, antiderivative of x plus 1 to the power of 10 dx. Now I'm going to go ahead and calculate my antiderivative. So 1 over 10x x plus 1 to the power of 10 minus 1 over 10. Antiderivative. Take your current exponent, it's a 10. If I add 1, it becomes 11. If I divide by 11, that's the same as 1 over 11. x plus 1 to the power of 11. If I multiply by the derivative of the inside, it's a 1. 1 over 1 would be a 1, so it's not changing anything, plus c. For your final answer, I can simplify it by multiplying my 1 over 10 by my 1 over 11. So my final answer for number 2, 1 over 10x, x plus 1 to the power of 10 minus top times top, 1 times 1 is 1, bottom times bottom, 10 times 11 is 110, x plus 1 to the power of 11 plus c, and you are done. Okay, so that would be your final answer for number two. Let's go ahead and look at number three. Now number three, I can do substitution. I know that because if I have f of x as the square root of x, g of x would be 4x minus 1. The derivative of 4x minus 1 is just a 4. Well, I can turn a 1 into a 4 or a 4 into a 1 by multiplying by a constant. Okay, so substitution works. And again, it's the antiderivative of f, fill in your original g of x plus c. So when you are doing substitution, you are doing decomposition. So it's the square root of x, which is the same thing as x to the one-half power. But underneath that square root, it's not just an x, it's 4x minus 1. The derivative of 4x minus 1 is a 4. Now here's the deal. This has to have a 4 here. Well, I don't see a 4. So what happened is something was multiplied by this 4 to turn it into a 1. That would be a 1 fourth. So there's 1 fourth out front because 4, four times 1 fourth would give me that 1 out front. Now, antiderivative of f of x. If I have an exponent of 1 half, if I add 1, that becomes 3 halves. If you divide by 3 halves, it's the same as multiplying by the reciprocal, which is 2 thirds. So I have 2 thirds x to the 3 halves plus c. When you're doing substitution, I have my 1 fourth out front. Now I take the antiderivative, but where x is, I fill in g of x. So it's 2 thirds. Where x is, I fill in 4x minus 1. It's to the 3 halves plus c. I can simplify this or make it, um, yeah, I can take this a little bit further by multiplying these. I can simplify by cross-canceling. Remember, when you multiply fractions, that's where you can cross-cancel. 2 and 4 are both divisible by a 2. So if I divide by 2, this would become a 1. This would become a 2. Top times top is 1. Bottom times bottom, 2 times 3 is 6. 4x minus 1 to the power of 3 halves plus c, and you are done. So guys, that is it for number 3. Number 4. This one, um, you can do substitution. I put this one on here because when you initially look at it, at least for me, I look and I'm like, okay, parts. But this is substitution because check this out. If I have the cosine of x, that would be f of x. x squared would be g of x. The derivative of x squared is 2x. I have the x. You can change a 2 to a 1 by multiplying by a constant. So this is substitution. And again, I'm going to write the formula because this is a study guide. I want to make sure that we write it over and over and over so when you get to that test, you are ready to go. Okay, so substitution, we're going to go ahead and do a decomposition. 
it is a cosine of x. But instead of x, they have x squared. In order to do substitution, you do the derivative of g of x, which is 2x. Now, 2x is technically what's here. I'm only seeing 1x, so that means that my 2x must have been multiplied by a 1 half. 2x times 1 half would give me that 1x. Antiderivative. So here's my little paper again. Antiderivative of a cosine. If I take the antiderivative of a cosine, it is a sine of x. So sine of x plus c. I have the 1 half up front. You take the antiderivative, which is the sine, but instead of x, you put your g of x value, which for us was x squared, plus c. So my final answer is 1 half times the sine of x squared plus c, and you're done. So the first four, it reviewed integration by substitution, integration by parts. I went sure, or I made sure to go through all the steps. That way, when you are doing your test, remember to list all the important pieces. Please box your final answer, because as you can see, it kind of gets to be a lot of work, so it does help me a little bit, so I'd, I'd really, really appreciate it. This is your review from 9.1 and 9.2. Moving on to what are called definite integrals, what that means is that you have the numbers on the top and bottom. So after you find your antiderivative, you have to go one step further and go ahead and do the fundamental theorem of calculus. So we have two examples like this. These are from um, 9.3. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and rewrite this. Remember the very, very first video that we did. I went ahead and I said, if it helps you, you can always rewrite things in like an equivalent manner. So rather than having x squared plus one to the power three on the bottom, you can write that as x squared plus one to the negative power of three. These two things are equivalent to one another. They have the exact same value. It's just a different way of writing it. I like this because to me, now it's obvious that this should be substitution because I do see that exponent. So I know that f of x could be x to the negative power of three. Then g of x, well, what am I taking to the negative power of three? Well, I'm taking x squared plus one. The derivative of x squared plus 1 is 2x. I have the x here. What I don't have is the 2. So that means 1 half had to have been out front because 2x times 1 half would get me to that x. So it matches. Now your antiderivative, if my exponent is a negative 3, if I add 1, it becomes negative 2. If I divide by negative 2, that's the same as multiplying by a negative 1 half, x to the negative power of 2 plus c. Okay, now substitution, here is the formula. So I have my one half out front. Now it's negative one half. Instead of x, you fill in x squared plus one. That's to the negative power of two plus c. Now I can multiply these. Positive times a negative, that's a negative. Top times top, one times one is how I got a one. Two times two is four. Now this is x squared plus one to the negative power of two plus c. This is your antiderivative. Now if we did not have the zero and the one here, we'd be done. But when you have the zero to one, what that means is you actually wanna find the area underneath the curve between zero and one. So I have to do the fundamental theorem of calculus. So if I put in a one, find the value, put in a zero, find the value. Okay, so let's go ahead, if I put in a one, I would have negative one fourth out front. One squared is one. One plus one is two. Two to the power of negative two is a one fourth, okay? Because one squared is one, one plus one is two. The negative would put it on the bottom, so I would have one over two squared, which is one fourth, plus c. Again, if you're plugging this in your calculator and doing decimals, you go for it, it's all good. Okay, if I have negative one-fourth, now if I put in a zero, zero squared is zero, zero plus one is one. One to the power of negative two means one over one squared, which is one, plus c. So this is negative one over 16, because top times top, bottom times bottom, plus c, minus negative one-fourth plus c, because one times a negative one-fourth keeps it at 
a negative one fourth. C minus C cancels, minus a negative turns it into a plus, so negative one over 16 plus one over four. If I go ahead and make this so it's common denominator, negative one over 16 plus four over 16, my common denominator stays a 16, negative one plus four is three, and we're done. Okay, so this one I went ahead and kept it as fractions. So the next one I'm gonna go ahead and do decimals. You can do whichever method you prefer. Let's look at one more, guys. Okay, now if I'm looking at this one, I can't, I can't do, um, yeah, there's no way. Okay, I was looking to see if I could do substitution. This one, you guys, I, I can't do substitution. I can't figure out what my decomposition would be. I could do x to the negative power of two, but it is only an x. And so this one, I have to do integration by parts. And remember that is f of x times the antiderivative of g of x minus the derivative of f of x times the antiderivative of g of x times dx, okay? So I have to do integration by parts. I'm gonna go ahead, find the antiderivative, and then I have to fill in from a one to a two. When you're doing integration by parts, think of the quotient rule and the product rule. Quotient rule, the top is always f of x, the bottom is always g of x. So here, f of x, the numerator, is the natural log of x. g of x is x to the negative power of 2. Remember, it has a negative exponent because it's on the bottom. The derivative of f of x, the derivative of a natural log of x, well, that's 1 over x. The antiderivative of g of x. If I have negative 2, if I add 1, it's a negative 1. If I divide, it's negative x to the negative first power plus c. Or if you prefer, you could write it as negative 1 over x plus c. These two things are equivalent. So again, however you prefer to write this. Now if I'm going to go ahead and find the antiderivative. The natural log of x, that's f of x, times the antiderivative, so negative 1 over x, minus 1 over x, because that's the derivative of f of x, times negative 1 over x dx. Okay, now to simplify this a little bit, I'm just going to go ahead and multiply these together. I can go top times top, bottom times bottom. So this is the negative natural log of x over x. Here, Positive times a negative is a negative, so technically I can bring that negative out front and make this a plus, okay? So this negative one, negative times a negative is how I got a plus, so this is gone. Now if I'm multiplying these, top times top, bottom times bottom, this is one over x squared dx. Well, one over x squared is the same thing as x to the negative power of two. Now I have negative natural log of x over x, antiderivative. If this is negative one and I add one, or sorry, if this is negative two and I add one, it's a negative one. So if I divide, it would be a negative out front, x to the negative power of one plus c. So you could leave it like this, or you could have it like this. This is your antiderivative. Now what I have to do is evaluate using the fundamental theorem of calculus. If I look back at my original problem for number six, we're going from one to two. So one to two, what that means is I have to calculate f of two, f of one. Now the last one, I went ahead and did it as a fraction. So this one, I'm gonna go ahead and just put everything into the calculator. So negative natural log of two divided by two. So this would be the first piece. So negative 0 0.3465, so I'm going to go 3, or 0.347, minus 1 over 2 is 0.5 plus C. Okay, now I'm going to put in a 1. Negative natural log of 1 divided by 1. So the first piece here, this is a 0, minus 1 over 1 is 1 plus C. So again, what I did is I put a 2 into this piece, and I got this put a two into this piece, and I got this plus C minus. Put a one into this piece, I got a zero, minus one into this piece, I got a one, plus C. Well, we know the C's always cancel. I can simplify this. Negative 0.347 minus 0.5. This is a negative 0 0.847 minus. Zero minus one is a negative one. I already cross-canceled my C's, or crossed those off. 
minus a negative becomes a plus. So if I take negative 0 0.847 and I add one because I'm minusing a negative, I'd have 0 0.153. That is my final answer. So those two examples are reviewing our concepts from 9.3. One, we went ahead and um, evaluated keeping it in the form of fractions. The other one, I went ahead and plugged it into my calculator. Again, you do whatever method you are the most comfortable with. Last question, this was our applications from 9.5. This is called present value, and the formula is T sub 1 to T sub 2. So this is years. Then it is K of T. Okay, so that could be income. It could be profit. It could be revenue. And this is based off of times of, or how many times during the year. So this is how much revenue, income, okay, whatnot. So K of T. Then it's times E as a base, negative R. Whatever your rate is, make sure you turn it to a decimal, negative times T. Now T is your variable because this is based off of DT. So what's going to happen is you're going to change this into a value, this into a value, but T will remain the same. So here is our one example. Find the present value of a continuous stream of income over the next four years. So there's zero to four. Over the next four years means you're starting right now for four years. Where the rate of income is 50 times e to the negative 0 0.08 t, thousands of dollars per year. So that's K of t. How much per year? It's an income of 50 e to the negative 0 0.08 t per year. Then it's e to the negative rate. The interest rate is 12%. So that's 0.12 times t dt. Now this is one of those cool problems where this is a common base. I can multiply these two pieces together. You take your number times your number, or even better, 50 times 1 is 50. I can bring the 50 out front because that's a constant multiple. Go ahead, bring it out front. So that is gone. E and E, because it's the same base, you write it once. You're multiplying, so you add your exponents. Negative 0 0.08t plus negative 0.12t is negative 0.2t dt. So I have my 50 out front. Now if I find the antiderivative of this, it is an e term. So you keep your term the same. Find the derivative of the exponent, which is negative 0.2. You divide by that. So it's 1 over negative 0.2 plus c. I can multiply that together. This is the same thing as 50 over 1, so 50 times 1 is 50, 1 times negative 0.2 is negative 0.2. So 50 over negative 0.2, I get negative 250 e to the negative 0.2t plus c. So this is my complete antiderivative. In order to calculate the present value, again, it's in thousands of dollars, we have to go from 0 to 4 because it's for the next four years. So if I fill in f of 4 minus f of 0, I can just go ahead and plug this in at one time. Negative 250 e to the negative 0.2 times 4. This is negative 112.33 plus c minus. Now I can up arrow, and I want to change t from a 4 to a 0. I get negative 250. So negative 250 plus C, C minus C cancels, minus a negative turns into a plus. So negative 112.33 plus 250. My decimal value is 137.67. It's dollars in the thousands. So you can go ahead and just label 137.67 thousands, and that is your test review. Good luck on your test, guys. Remember, you can use your books, use your notes. It is an open book test. Last chapter test of the year, knock her out of the park. Proud of you every day. See you later.